Welcome back um, to the Ignite Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Bell. Today, I have Alex Lazaro with us. Alex, uh, he's been an inventor for a long time. He's an author, uh, been around the startup ecosystem. Alex, would love to get an intro from you and, and dive in. Hey, thanks a lot for hosting me. Um, and excited to have a fun conversation. I'm Alex Lazaro. I'm a venture capitalist uh, with Fluent Ventures. We're a global VC fund. Our strategy is geo arbitrage. We think the world's biggest ideas are global. We think the solutions are local, and we're trying to back local monopolies in global categories. I'm also uh, the author of Out Innovate, a global entrepreneurs from Delhi, Detroit, are rewriting the role of Silicon Valley, and I live in the Bay Area. I'm excited to, to join you here today. Nice. I didn't realize you were in the Bay. Um, whereabouts are you? Uh, I'm in uh, Marin, so just north of San Fran. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm out in El Dorado Hills, which is uh, east of Sacramento. Moved out during oh, COVID. beautiful over there. Very cool. Yeah, we're right on uh, Lake Folsom. So we got deer in our front yard. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good move. Oh, that's awesome. And a lot less fog, I imagine. But yeah, I would love to. Um, yeah, a lot less fog. Uh, yeah, Marin gets, gets it pretty bad, right? Uh, it's, you know, um, it, it really varies by neighborhood. It's so... Um, uh, so microcosm driven where we are, we see the fog, but we're not in it. So we're kind of in between. Nice. Yeah. I remember, uh, living in inner sunset. Um, you know, when I moved to the Bay, <laughs> when I, I didn't know it was the weather was going to be so bad there. And I remember literally, I think I had tears of joy when I moved to Walnut Creek, uh, to the East Bay and, and I, and I was in like 95 degree, sunny, warm weather, uh, because I remember like seeing, you know, in a sense that you get up to like Sutro and you can kind of look out and you see yeah. that it's sunny and warm, just not where you're at. Walk us through how you, you know, got into venture. Would love to kind of hear that origin story. Yeah, uh, happily. Um, when told in retrospect, it's, it, it can sound like a straight line, but I think that I'm an actual accidental venture capitalist. I grew up in a small town in the middle of Canada. My mom's uh, Belgian. My grandfather was a computer engineer, you know, like vacuum tubes. Um, Helped open up a bunch of uh, countries for Africa with, with IBM, and my father's family is American with a pretty international background. And so I, I've had one foot in a in the middle of Canada, one foot a little bit internationally. And when I was in undergrad, I thought I would do a PhD in development, developmental economics, and and I thought my life was to go down the road of academia. Um, and kind of a combination of some mentors giving me some advice and and a little bit of a spirit of experimentation before doing that, I ended up working on the Canadian version. Of Wall Street, uh, Bay Street in Canada, doing investment banking, and fell in love with the tool of finance. Perhaps not selling Canadian insurance companies, but um, this was the time that Mohammed Yunus had just won the Nobel Peace Prize, and impact investing was on the rise. Um, so instead, I decided I would do an MBA with this idea of doing something like what I'm doing today. Although I, I, did, I don't even think I would have called it or known the word venture capital per se. Um, ended up working in consulting for a while um, in a bunch of different emerging market countries. Um, and getting really focused on fintech and the tool of financial services to, to drive inclusion. And, and that's what led me into the road of venture about, about 10 years ago. I joined Omidia Network, the family office of Pierre and Pam Omidia, right as we were setting up a, a fintech fund at the, at the beginning of kind of the last wave of fintech. Yeah, to, to talk us through, there seems to be a fintech winter happening right now, as people call it, and now it's thawing out again. And what was that? Was it just a like a hype cycle that where everybody was a big land grab and what kind of sparked it in the first place? So I, I actually am not sure I agree with the winter perspective. I think the curb of fintech has been kind of up and steady. And then we had an aberration and that aberration correlated with a lot of other aberrations on valuation and venture capital dollars going to segments, et cetera. And, and in many ways, fintech was perhaps the like eye of that storm um, in, in some ways, but things have kind of come back down to the trend line. But what was happening really is that insurance companies on the public markets, uh, like the lemonades and things like that, were getting valued as if gross return premium was revenue, or lending companies were valued, mm. getting valued as in like dollars out was revenue. And it, it, I, I think a fundamental misunderstanding broadly of like what what is a great fintech company. I think now people are like refocusing on what is actual revenue or actual earnings, et cetera. And so I, I don't think it's a winter. I think we're just kind of back to you know, what is the steady march trajectory if you mm. erase that, um, that aberration. Financial services is about 20% of the world economy and fintech penetration is less than 5% or something like that. I, there's a long way wow. to go. Um, mm. But I think that a lot of folks who were just visiting are, are gone. 
Uh, but I, I, I actually, I actually am still seeing kind of the steady drumbeat marching forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I liked, I like what you said in the, in your intro, which was uh, geographic arbitrage, uh, mono- local monopolies kind of, can we dig into that a bit? Like what that means? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, I think that in 2013 or something like that, like 10 years ago, 11 years ago, you would have been right to think that all the action and innovation was in one place, Silicon Valley. And today, like four cities had ever created a billion dollar business. Today, over 140 cities have done that, have created a billion dollar business. Mm. Um, and it isn't just big businesses are getting built all over the world. Often it's the biggest business, like the biggest ed tech in the world is in India, the biggest fintech in the world is in Brazil. Um, or, or new bank in the world, sorry, like the biggest RPA business from Romania. So innovation is really globalized. Um, mm. The other thing that's happening is that it's also localized. Like think of the story of Uber, right? Like ride sharing was invented in Silicon Valley, by the way, not even by Uber. That, mo- that model scaled internationally, but the <laughs> winner in every market was like, companies like 99 in Latam, Karim in the Middle East, Grab Gojek in Southeast Asia, Ola in India. And by the way, the world's biggest is Didi in China, where Uber also lost. And right. Our belief and my belief is that the world's innovation is going to globalize, but actually the winners will be local. And we're trying to back local winners in these proven de risk global business mm. model. Um, by the way, Uber is kind of a, a funny example for me to say. Like, you know, in, in my book, I talk about startup camels, like camel startups that have real unit economics, manage burn, et cetera. Like, I probably wouldn't have backed a ride sharing business back in the day, despite using it as an example here today. It's just as well yeah. understood. But, uh, but, but that's how I think innovation is happening, particularly in the fintech health e-commerce where I invest. Yeah. And do you prefer um, when you make investments to go concentrated um, or are you more dispersed, uh, wide, wide, wide ranging? Um, I guess there's two ways to answer the question. One is portfolio size and two is, like, am I trying to get a board seat? Um, yeah. The latter question, I would say I actually, I actually tell founders we as VCs have a portfolio. We have two or three, uh, in some cases, dozen investments. Um, you should too. Like you should also have a portfolio of VCs you work with. And you should have one local fund. I believe that mm. every market is going to have the equivalent of a Sequoia in every single local market. Right. You should perhaps have a domain specialist and perhaps you should have someone like us that has a kind of unique network of, of founders and um, kind of a business model expertise or what have you. Um, and And so... With that kind of philosophical approach to investing, I actually would prefer being the second biggest Jack or co-lead to a local fund. So that's kind of how we think about it. And then from a portfolio, you know, we, we want to invest invest in a bunch of companies, 20 to 30 um, type thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I share the same sentiments. Like, you know, we we invest worldwide and, and I have the same kind of thesis, I think. I think it's for uh, slightly different reasons, but... You know, I believe in, uh, yeah, these kind of localized unicorns is what you might call them, right? Where, you know, uh, there's a big company here that raises hundreds of millions of dollars in the U.S. And, you know, they're uh, a unicorn or worth billions of dollars, uh, but they haven't even entered the European market or the LATAM market or India or Southeast Asia, right? And, you know, these companies, these these founders can move so quickly in these localized markets and, and win. Uh, and I love that example of Uber, right? Hundred yeah. billion dollar company, right? Just huge success, but so many unicorns, decacorns, centacorns, um, in in lo- localities where Uber just couldn't win. Yeah, and and by the way, it isn't necessarily that they, that Uber couldn't win. It was that Uber shouldn't win, um, in the sense <laughs> that it is now so much cheaper to start a business anywhere. There's startup expertise on how to do it, and there's local. VCs that know their markets way better than the VCs at Uber, um, that you can actually build, you can get a product off the ground. And like Uber is a little bit unique because there's some version of network effects that are more local or regional. They're certainly not right. global by and large, um, right. but it's reasonably cheap to just like build, get a product to market. And by the way, this, this cheaper, cheaper to get a, biz, a product to market is going to accelerate like with AI and et cetera. Um, I actually think we're going to see less and less kind of global companies, particularly outside of like enterprise, R&D, super CapEx heavy things, like kind of the rest of tech. Right. I think we're going to see way more local businesses and then we'll see kind of global ones. And by local, I mean regional, uh, not yeah. necessarily like one city or one country, but we might see a region play out. Yeah. And another way to describe that might be like the deeper in the stack you go and the, the higher the CapEx, 
which requires the, the, the global scale to, to make a payback, right? Like yeah. you, you think about like foundational models like OpenAI or what micro, like the, the kind of stuff Microsoft builds, right? But yeah. there's lots of hyper-local, verticalized, regional winners that end up being multi-billion dollar uh, wins, um, yeah. which is part of our thesis too, I think, is like fo focusing at that application layer locally and, and finding founders that can build these like kind of local 100 million run rate. I think wave one of this was consumer, right? Like it was consumer startups scaled internationally. Like wave two has been a bunch of these B2B style companies and some SaaS. Um, and I think we're seeing that play out. And like I, I've invested a bunch of these B2B marketplaces as an example. Um, but further down the stack isn't an impossibility. It, I think it's just harder and it actually requires more infrastructure, but we're going to see this too. Um, I think if it's cheaper than ever to launch like a B2B SaaS business that does X, right. say CRM, um, yeah. you could imagine more industry specific ones getting built and like Salesforce is getting unbundled as we speak. Like I use affinity yeah. for instance, um, as a VC, but you could imagine like the, like what's the next thing after that? Well, like you might say, well, actually we might do a, um, CRM just for VCs that are international in this X market or that are doing like yeah. SaaS based businesses and want to integrate match. Like you could imagine that happen pretty quickly. Um, yeah. so I, I actually think we're going to see this play out farther down the stack and, and, and perhaps open AI and foundational models will be a little bit insulated. And yet even then, right, it's easier, easier to train a, you know, an open source llama model or whatever too. So we're like, we, we might see this kind of play, play down over time, but that's, that's kind of a 10 year, 10 year story, not a, not a two year one. Yeah. And I love that. It's, it's kind of like what Andreessen said with software eating the world. Now AI is eating software, generating ever more software in every single nook and cranny that software can exist, right? It's kind of like this evolutionary, like nicheism of <laughs> Darwinian SAS, yeah. where it, 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 you know, there's a bird that's just perfectly suited for that, like particular kind of sand or rocky terrain to get the worm, uh, you know, and I guess there's lots of SAS birds out there getting, getting very, very niche uh, and getting the worm, right? Um, it's like a proliferation. Back to the, the FinTech question. You know, why did fintech burst on the scene, call it in the 2010s and not like, you know, when the internet burst on the scene, call it in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s? What was it about kind of the 2010s where it kind of all of a sudden unlocked this stuff? So I would say I think that fintech was part of wave one of tech innovation, too. Like think of yeah. a lot of big online brokerages that moved from in-person to web and that platform mm. shift brought about new companies. Um, I think that we saw a bigger explosion that touched more of our lives um, for a couple of reasons. And one was the platform shift. We went from web to mobile um, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden opened a much larger TAM. Like if you think when I started investing in fintech, um, the numbers originally two and a half and three billion people were unbanked and about the same amount of people were underbanked, like a massive amount of people. And all of a sudden yeah. we had a very low cost channel to reach them. Uh, we had a bunch of data about them. Like it was impossible to do lending to people if they were on a credit score registry. All of a sudden, you could um, if you had some alternative data about them. Um, uh, you had an expectation that the software you touch, if it's a bank or if it's healthcare or whatever it is, look like what you might touch on Amazon or Google, et cetera. So there's an expectation of a shift. Um, and then there's a trust factor. Um, I always say you can't move fast and break things when you do fintech or health or some of these things. Like it actually matters a lot when you're touching people's money or their health. Mm. And, and all of a sudden, I think people started trusting the software and the software is getting built better. Um, and so I think a bunch of these things happen all together um, to, to accelerate it. So I think that's one. The other reason is that you needed fintech. Like fintech has gone from a um, vertical, like, hey, we invest in technology, we invest in financial services, whatever, to like now a foundational layer where to be able to do e-commerce anywhere on the planet, you need a payments layer. And that's a fintech business. And if you want to do like B2B software or whatever, embedded fintech is now being part of it. But for any single app that we're talking about in emerging markets, like the Uber of X market, like Kareem, to be able to do that, you need to do payments. You need to figure out a way to like manage cash uh, in the form of market. You have to do all this stuff. So like fintech was actually something that needed to happen for everything else and anything else by and large yeah. to happen. So I think that's one of the other reasons that that I think it played out in such a meaningful way and got, you know, got the adoption and is getting the adoption. Getting. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of verticalized um, uh, implementations of large language models right now into different verticals uh, in fintech, like, you know, for financial advice or, you know, tax advice or tax filing. Do you feel like there's, there's an opportunity here or do you feel like the incumbents 
find innovation before these startups find distribution? Um, I, think, this, I think there's like two different shift. questions in my mind. Yeah. One is, will LLMs find a, a applicability in financial services? And to there, the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, I, I, I think it'll be really important. It probably won't look like open AI, chat GPT, just like wide, wide, wide uh, distribution. Like I think we'll need to get it right. We'll have to figure out the guardrails. We'll have to figure out how to like manage confidentiality. But like, yes, we're going to see this. Two is, is this going to be a platform shift? Like web, uh, like in-person to web and web to mobile, will it be mobile to AI? There, I don't think so, except for a narrow set of things, maybe. Um, mm. I actually think that distribution will matter and that AI will be a tool to either personalize experience to customers or drive efficiency in the back end. That doesn't mean it'll be incumbents. I actually think that, for instance, I'm an early stage investor in Chime Bank. Um, Chime is a nice example of this like, shift from web to, to mobile and create a mobile-based bank. Like, it doesn't seem like we should have a AI Chime. Like, but, but I bet that every single one and every single neobank in the world is thinking about how do we actually do personalization in some way. Right. Else, right? Like, and, and, and so it seems like the fintechs of today and the incumbents of today will be able to use this as a tool. Uh, but, it, yeah. but there are probably some exceptions. Like, I, I think there'll be some net new businesses. We talked a little bit about that, too. Like, I think there'll be some net new businesses that get created because LLMs allow things to exist that they didn't before. Um, but at least for me, I'm not, I'm not banking on this as a platform shift the way I did. The, anal the analogy I'm using in my mind, the way I'm thinking about it is like, you know, how do, how do the ultra wealthy manage their daily lives, right? The, their tasks, right? They have an assistant they can talk to, right? They can call their broker, their financial advisor, their wealth manager. Um, they're literally giving out verbal commands to do things. Yeah. They're not like logging into interfaces and executing the tasks, right? They're talking to somebody who logs into the interface and executes the tasks. So I'm thinking about, you know, in the future, in the you know, next five or 10 years, are we all just talking to our AIs to do stuff for us? Like, like the uber wealthy uh, talk to their assistants, like, uh, I don't know, Fortune 500 execs talk to their, their staff members to, to do things, um, to get things done. I think, yes, and w w one is, I, I think we're going to see more of this verbal interface with something that will be able to re respond intelligently. I also think the interface will be able to um, solve a bunch of questions that perhaps that rich person needed to think about uh, in the past. Like now, all of a sudden, this orchestration between, hey, I have a big mortgage payment for like X thing and I need to figure out a way to get liquidity on my stock brokerage. Like perhaps those things can be automated in a smart way to divest the thing that's going to be for tax loss harvesting versus not whatever. Like I think we're going to see that. Right. Um, and then two, the question, which is a fintech question is, well, who's going to run that AI? And is it going to be a fintech AI or will we all have a chat GPT instance on our phone with permissions um, to all of our bank accounts and that will run it. Yeah. And so it won't be a non-fintech, it will be a non-fintech company that wins. That I don't know, uh, but but I think that's playing out live. It's an, it's an interesting kind of question, right? You know, uh, will uh, this new AI platform go the way of SaaS where... You know, you have these uh, big sales force like CRM, kind of horizontal, kind of bundled approaches uh, like ChatGPT, call it five coming out. Um, and it's multimodal and it does a bunch of stuff. Um, and then you have these verticalized uh, startups uh, fine tuning, forking their own open source models to really fine tune the use case and really, really get good at specific things. Do, do, what do you think? Do you think it goes like in that vertical bundled, unbundled? Uh, kind of phase phasing like we saw in SaaS, or, or, is, or is it like this Uber model that's super intelligent, trained on everything, can do everything? In some ways, are are you asking, is this going to be? Are we going to see full stack players versus more like niche unbundled ones? Is that in some ways yeah. kind of like what you're yeah. getting out of the question? Yeah. Who was it that said? That there's only two ways to make money by unbundling or rebundling. Uh, there's a there's a famous quote yeah, about Jim this. Barksdale. Yes, uh, I think we're going to see like that. So it, it might not necessarily be we're going to see one thing and that'll be the thing that wins. We might actually see kind of successive waves of this, perhaps. Uh, but it does feel like there's kind of two spectrums of this. There's going to be the super big outcomes. OpenAI, Anthropic, et cetera, 
Um, they're requiring a ton of venture money. Yeah, big, big hundred billion trillion dollar outcomes, right? We'll, we'll see one or two new trillion dollar companies uh, come yeah. out of this wave Hopefully, or multiple, right? It'll be like a small handful. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think, and, 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 and just your point of like the birds chasing the worms, like uh, I actually think we might see a lot of very, very small <laughs> companies getting built because it's so much cheaper to do it. Uh, people are talking about how you know, yeah. the companies in the future might just need three people to run it. And then a hundred right. bot agents yeah. do it. Um, and if that's true, which I which I actually happen to believe it is, uh, we'll see a, a, a very long tail of things that can unbundle single products. And then we'll have to have a way to coordinate a lot of that. And perhaps that'll be the role of the bigger the bigger platforms and things like that. But but I I think we might see we might see some of that play out. Is that the long tail of services yeah. might actually get longer rather than consolidate? Which, by the way, I think is good news from a yeah. landscape perspective. In a service perspective. Well, and it's really good news for for an early stage investor uh, like ourselves, right? Um, Maybe because I mean, what I'm it does is it sure creates. Do yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'd love to like pull on that thread a little bit, right? Because I I see that happening, right? You know, with a couple co founders and a bunch of AI building million run rate businesses, right? And they're still growing, right? So where's the ceiling? And does that create more opportunities for early stage VCs? Um, or do we kind of go the way of, um, you know, the uh, the travel agent, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't need us as much to allocate scarce capital uh, because the inputs to creating software are falling to zero. I'd love to pull on that thread a bit. I, I think the question is, what do the outcomes look like? Um, and if it's cheaper than ever to launch a business, then I think that what it takes to make something really big and meaningful, like a hundred million revenue business outcome or you know or a billion dollars yeah. revenue business outcome to do that like it's probably that much harder like the power law actually gets that much steeper um and mm. and so uh I, I think that's kind of the challenge like i i actually think that perhaps the the stakes are bigger it's cheaper than ever like to to get something started like it used to be that the hard part that venture venture investors did is they funded like actual servers that went into someone's uh, garage or whatever, or like, and then you then started to do a product, yeah. and then you tried to figure out if you sell. It. Like, I actually think the risk profile in venture is changing, where you don't have to. Do, you already don't have to do the first part with Amazon Web Services, right? Like, you don't have to do that. Uh, you can rent it. Right. Perhaps what AI is doing is actually is allowing us to de-risk the second part. Like, you can actually get to a product very fast. And then the question is, like, can you yeah. figure out a uh, scaling fit? Like, it it becomes kind of venture is taking a scaling fit risk. Um, then the question is like, well, then who wins in that game? Like, do smaller funds win or do bigger funds? If it's a scaling fit bet, perhaps you actually need more money. You know, perhaps you take less money to get to a million or two million of revenue, but then you actually very quickly graduate to the big rounds or to the cottage business. Um, and so actually, perhaps like the way you build a portfolio in venture changes um, and, and, and the fund size of changes. I, I, I think that's playing out, but certainly some of the things I'm thinking about. Yeah, that's really interesting. Very insightful. Um, and you kind of you, you you saw this basically with uh, when cloud came out, it sort of correlated with the the angel in, uh, investing community kind of growing in, in dramatic size. Angelus becoming a thing, you know, um, this angel round kind of round shifting around. And yeah, I'd love to kind of just dig into that kind of how you think it's it's changing and what you know what what this looks like five or five or 10 years from now. I and you have a lot of great mean, ideas like there to pull on. Community? Yeah. What, yeah. What so like, if you look yeah. historically, yeah, like technology enabled venture capital, right. And, and vice versa. Right. Um, and then you had the internet, which you described as like putting servers in a, in a closet, right. And spinning up a dot com. Uh, and it, it would cost five or $10 million to, to get that website up. Yeah. And then, and then you had cloud, which, brought that down to zero, right? And uh, around that time, it changed venture, right? Because now yeah. venture became, uh, like you said, it became much more of a scaling mechanism, right? Because you could go out and find product market fit easier with less money because it was practically zero with you know AWS credits to go mess around with some software and build it, right? And now AI is generating the software. So you're getting product market fit faster than ever. And well, at least building a product that, uh, that people want faster than ever. So how does that change early stage venture versus late stage? Maybe what you're describing is that absolutely correct, which is the power law gets steeper. And so the big rounds get bigger, 
but there's this long tail of uh, earlier and earlier and smaller and smaller rounds to, to help these kind of companies try to get to that, call it three to five million revenue mark where a, a big VC wants to write a huge check to help you scale. So a couple of things that I think are going to happen in venture um, tied to this. One is the power law of outcomes is getting steeper, but I think that the power law of venture capital firms is also going to play out that way where we're seeing this already happen. Like Andreessen's raising a boatload of money, but it's actually easier than ever for a new manager to get started and run a fund on AngelList right. or do SPVs to get started and build a track record. And so I actually think we're going to see the long yeah. tail of VCs continue to exist. Um, and I think it's going to be tricky for the kind of random $200 million fund um, that's generalist, et cetera. Like I, I actually think there's going to be a push to hyper-specialize or grow or shrink. Um, but getting caught in the middle, I think is going to be tricky. I think the second thing that's going to happen is global. And this is a big thing that I'm betting on um, uh, as well. I think that the cat's out of the bag. Like innovation is no longer a Silicon Valley thing or a, or a Western right. world. Thing. It's, it's global. And it's arguably better to build a business in many parts outside of the U.S. for a variety of reasons. Um, and, uh, and so I think every VC fund is going to have to at least have an answer. They might, they might choose not to be global. They should have at least an answer about where they're going and why and where they're not going and why. Um, and so mm. I, think that'll be, I think that'll be a big part of it. Um, and I think third, and you alluded to this as well, uh, of saying, you know, our, our VC is going to go the, the way of the Dodo. I don't believe that. I actually think that venture uh, is a craft business in many ways. Like I, I think there's a lot mm. of work into to helping companies, like the company building perspective. Uh, but I do think that computerization is going to be a big trend that's not going to go away. We saw this with a big way with revenue-based financing companies like Clearco and Pipe and others. Um, mm. that don't fund equity, right. they don't fund debt, but they fund this middle space, which is repeatable sales spend. Um, and that was completely automated. Um, I actually think that that's a big deal. I think we're going to see some of this kind of stuff, this computerized decision-making, and perhaps the product is revenue-based financing, perhaps the product is something else. But we're going to see that as, as an input into a lot of decision-making, just given given the revenue, uh, the efficiency of the business, et cetera, yeah. it's all digital. And you know that's effectively the role of an analyst. Um, at a VC fund or, or at a debt player of like doing that work and, and that can be um, obfuscated away now. Yeah, I was um, going to have a podcast guest um, out of, a, you might call it a venture firm, but it's a revenue-based financing firm. Kind of, um, when do you think it's a good idea for a company to do that and when not to do it and, and, and things like that? I'm not too familiar with that space. Yeah, so what revenue-based financing does is it helps you fund revenue growth. Um, at its at its core, and you get uh, access to capital based on existing revenue. And so, I think that revenue based financing works is when you have a repeatable sales motion. You can say, "I'm going to put one dollar into CAC, and I will get four dollars in terms of gross margin over the lifetime of the business." And I could either fund that one dollar with equity, which is really expensive, like a VC like us um, expect a you know a, a, probably one of the highest IRRs in the market, um, or I could fund it with with RBF, and that'll be like mid-teens IRR cost. Um, and as long as the IRR on the LTV, on your limited, uh, on your lifetime value is higher than kind of the IRR, that's actually a, a better use of capital than, than equity. Um, so I think it works th well then. I don't think it works well to fund R&D yeah. and, and risky activities, um, nor do I think it right. works really well to fund the like lowest if you're an insure tech or a, a fintech player and you're using capital to like lend out or fund uh, fund an insurance company like that's the lowest risk. You should use venture debt or like some other thing. But in this kind of middle zone, I think that's where RBF plays really nicely. Um, it's kind of a alternative to growth capital. Yeah, it's interesting, and uh, I've he I've heard it described as a, a sort of a bridge, right, between kind of call it a seed and an A or A and a B. Like you, you just need a little bit more juice uh, to kind of push through the operating model to kind of get to that next stage. I don't know. I, I would I would even say like it's probably the right answer at any stage of company if you have if if you have a repeatable sales motion uh, and you say hey I I pay one dollar I get four but it takes me two years to get my four dollars back I should I should spend as much as possible today on the one and I have limited resources to fund operations and R and D I, I think it's a pretty good use of capital that's cheaper than venture dollars like I I, I would say at scale a Series B might yeah. consider doing this and a bootstrap company. 
that has product market fit should also consider doing this. Like I, I, I actually don't right. necessarily think it's right. a bridge. Um, I think it could be used to that effect. But, but I, I, to me, to me, the better question is: Do you have product market fit and repeatable sales motion? I think it's really good mm. there. Yeah, I love that. So thinking about sort of. Um... You know the venture landscape, the the conversation we're having on how venture's changing and the power law is changing. Uh, how do you go about going forward? Um, to f how do you how do you go about identifying unicorns, right? Because that's kind of the name of the game, right? You're trying to find these future billion dollar companies. How is that shifting with with this increasing steep slope of power law? Um, first, it's really hard, and I think it will be harder. Uh, than it was in the past, just because there are more VCs and there are way more startups. What I believe right. is that the world's best ideas are global, the winners are local, and you can actually figure out what those best ideas are, like, and not all of them, like, but a subset of them are, by understanding yeah. what, what is really big somewhere else, right? Like William Gibson wants where the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Well, let's look where we know the Ooh, future exists and what are the best de-risks business models. And, and that's what I'm looking for. Um, so for instance, in India, of the top 10 unicorns in India, four are roughly the same business model. They're a B2B marketplace uh, that is formalizing the long tail of merchants that offers free software and embedded fintech. One happens to be in construction, one happens to be in uh, industrial, one happens to be in FMCG, but like they're a similar kind of business. That business model is now getting replicated all over the world. And there are local versions of some of these. So it's like you've seen it work, say, in California. Um, yeah. and it's become a multi-billion dollar company and it just hasn't been replicated in India. So it's basically like, oh, it's Uber, but for Brazil, but it's in, that kind way, of, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm rocket internet on the sort copy. of approach. Yeah. I'm careful on the copycat thing personally. Um, uh, cause I actually don't think yeah. you can copy paste. And we, we spoke about Chime as an example, like the first hundred million dollar round in a unicorn neobank anywhere on the planet was revenue. But in the UK, um, there's low interchange. Um, it's reasonably well banked. There's a lot of competition. And as a result, every new bank in Europe, including Revolut, were like lead gen businesses with a lost lead and checking account. In America, the context is different. And so the actual business model is different too. Um, right. China right. exists in a market that had 60 million people that are unbanked or underbanked, um, $30 billion overdraft fee model. And so they started with a, and, and 100x the interchange. And so they, they had a free bank account for the low end of the market with interchange and software like gross margin. So like similar insight, but actually very different business under the hood. I think that's where we're going to see play out everywhere on the planet. Um, but so you can follow the wave, but you actually have to also then understand why it localizes or by the way, why it doesn't. There's a lot of places where the neobank model didn't work because, because the local market was not favorable. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about that? Like why, why it broke down, why entrepreneurs were trying to replicate it in a market and it didn't work? Is it just a matter of like kind of the, the local system wasn't ready for it or? I don't think it's a local system. I think it's a kind of insight to kind of local market fit wasn't always there. And, and I'd argue, by the way, in Europe, where oh, the first wave of these breaking out, I would say like that's actually the toughest market to do it because interchange is low, because it's actually a reasonably well banked market. Um, and, and, and in different ecosystems, like in Brazil, for instance, um, there's high cost credit. Um, yet very low credit card penetration and very high POS penetration, the amount of places you pay with credit card. And so like the new bank model scaled, but for totally different reasons than Chime. Like new bank looks more like Capital One in America. It's a credit card company. I was an investor in a company called Neon, which is similar, similar kind of business. Um, but then you might say like in Mexico, which has some of the dynamics of America and some of the dynamics of Brazil, uh, it's actually an even better market. And yet it's actually been in some ways arguably really hard to execute because there's just so much competition. Mm. Um, and so there's a bunch of big neo banks, including new bank that's gone and a bunch of others. Um, and so I, I, I think there's been kind of a, a combination of, uh, what, what are the local market dynamics that make this good or bad? And then second, what's kind of the level of competition locally, um, either from incumbents yeah. or some new startups that, that have kind of determined whether or not there's been some breakouts and, and by the way, regulation, uh, yeah. which is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> Thinking, uh, there are some new payment rails coming out, this real-time payment system. Maybe you could speak to that and maybe some opportunities it might unlock here in the U.S. Oh, any. man. Well, in the U.S., we have FedNow, of course. Um, in some ways, I actually think the bigger story that might show us where this is going is international. Um, in India, for instance, uh, there's a whole program called Adar, which is a universal ID system, and on top of which um, a bunch of infrastructure like bank accounts and 
uh, payment rails were built. And in Brazil, um, PIX has done real-time payments. The adoption of these have been through the roof. Um, and, and, and I can, I can share an article to, to link in the show notes if it's interesting on some of the PIX stuff um, and, and the growth. But I think what's exciting is that on top of that, a bunch of business models we couldn't even have imagined have started to uh, get built and replicated. Um, and, and so I, I, I think we're going to see some really interesting things being played out on, on FedNow as it, as it gets built out in the U.S. Um, I think it's going to, one, lower the cost of transaction at the low end. So smaller, smaller transactions will be a lot easier to do. Um, I think this will also make a lot of business models that were perhaps a little bit hard to build easier. Uh, as, a, mm. as a function of this, um, we could probably do a whole show on this. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but but, but we're, we're early next time. Next. Yeah, yeah, we'll put a pin in it and come back and have you on the show again. Um, what about blockchain and crypto? Um, what, what about I have that? never invested. I mean, you've been thinking about anything. fintech for a. Yeah, I I I, um, I I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013. Um, I've been very interested in it for a long time, and I have never invested venture money like someone else's money into crypto and the reason is is i don't yet have conviction on a use case um on this that's radically better than what existed mm-hmm. before like i i really think it's an important technology i am very interested in it i just haven't yeah. yet done it it hasn't fit my model there isn't a localized version of something that you could say hey let's replicate it outside of perhaps the exchanges in and out in the system and so um I'm still in the like curious and looking at it, but 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 have not yeah. have not jumped on the bandwagon for for better and for worse. That was always my problem with it too. As I looked at at it as an investor of my own money, and then subsequently of other people's money, and I would look at it and I go, "Why is it better than what exists? And what is the friction being removed and the problem being solved?" It was always like this like really cool technology looking for problems to solve rather than. Uh, the other way around, which is what you want to see as an investor. Like, oh, you found a really big thorny problem and you now have invented something to solve it. Um, and then and then you have the whole government re- re- regulation thing, right? You know, the government's not going to just sit idly by and let you replace all the, all their infrastructure that they manage and have a monopoly on. Um, so anyway, it's interesting that you kind of share my sentiments there. Um, are, you, are you still a uh, professor? Are you still like teaching? Um, I've, I have found, you know, um, I started my career thinking I'd become a professor one day. So I've always had this itch and that itch has manifested itself in my writing and, and also teaching. Uh, for a number yeah. of years, I was an adjunct with the Middlebury Institute for International Studies, which is the Middlebury College's graduate program. Um, I'm not doing uh. it right now, but, but we'd love to, uh, we'd love to do that again at some point, uh, perhaps when I'm less busy on all the, on all the day job and venture right now. Yeah, yeah. That's that's really cool. Like I, I've toyed with that idea multiple times in my career. Uh, you know, I taught high school math when I washed out of Wall Street. I almost got a graduate degree in psychology at one point. Um, you know, and then you know, of course, with the with the MBA, always toyed with the idea of going back and being a professor. So it's it's fun to give back and and uh, be back in the academic um, yeah. seat, as it were. You know, to, to explore ideas and debate things with students. Um, some rapid fire stuff before we close up. Um, what do you think the most underrated startup sector is? Oh man, well, uh, in 2021, I would give you a different answer, right? I would, I, I would actually say, say fintech today. Like, I think the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater. There's some really interesting yeah. opportunities and companies getting built. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of interesting stuff there too. Um, what's your favorite book on entrepreneurship besides the one you wrote, of course? Oh man. <laughs> um, it was so funny. I, I I read my book. I would probably struggle to reread it uh, again today. I would see so many things that I'd want to change. Uh, uh, that I'd want to change. Um, look, I I don't know if I have a favorite one. I'll tell you the one that I have read recently that I've really enjoyed. Um, is Sebastian Malaby's book on the power law. It touches on a lot of things that we talked about. Oh yeah, like the, of the venture, how it's changed, and where it's going. Um, so that's one one that I I would say is is kind of worth the read. And, and despite knowing a lot of the backstory, I, I still learned a lot. Yeah, I don't think I've read that one. I, I heard like a two hour long podcast interview on the book, but I need to go read the actual book. Um, what's one country poised for a startup explosion? Two countries I'm spending a lot of time in right now, uh, and I've doubled your answer, have been in Mexico <laughs> specifically, and I think we're going to see a big shift in growth in nearshoring. And the second is uh, Nigeria. 
um, in Africa of the 10 or so unicorns, seven are from Lagos. Uh, but we're only now starting to see a mafia of folks kind of coming out of those. I think that will accelerate as a lot of companies. Uh, There's so much entrepreneurship way. there. It's crazy. The amount and of deal way, flow I see. Per, per capita, I probably see more deal flow from Nigeria than anywhere else. I think there's such an entrepreneurial culture there. Um, there's, a, I, I think, a self-sufficiency ethos, ethos there where they, they really want to build things and, and start companies and uh, really, really cool, really cool country. Um, what's, what's one piece of advice you'd have for new investors? Probably got a lot of angels out there listening to this. Um, the best advice I was given when I started Venture was to meet a lot of entrepreneurs before I write my first ticket. Uh, when I started meeting founders, I thought mm. every single company was great. And by the way, like by and large, they often are, right? Like it's, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. someone that's exited whatever they were doing before, really believes in something, has like launched a business. Um, I say no yeah. a lot, as does every VC. And the reason I say no yeah, a right. lot often has nothing to do with the company. It has more to do with like the company's fit with what I'm trying to do, or, like the way I think about the world. And so like my fit yeah. with the founder. And, and so the advice I had been given by, by my, my uh, old boss, um, Arjuna, was meet a lot of founders and like build that, build that nose to understand what is a good fit for you um, and the kind of things that you want to you buy yeah. and you want to build. And so I would say meet 100 founders before you write your first check uh, or something like that. And, Ooh, and, I, and I, I love that advice. Yeah. Yeah. I love that advice. And, and, you know, generally also you have to make enough bets, right? Um, you know, angel investors, especially will concentrate too much. They'll have like five or 10 and they'll be like, Oh, I lost money and started investing. Well, you only made like six investments <laughs> and there were probably the first six things that came across your plate. Like while, while you were interested in investing. So, um, yeah, spread, spread your bets around, place your bets. Um, uh, and yeah, I can totally relate to that, you know, cause when I started angel investing, you know, six, seven years ago, yeah, like, like you, like everything sounded amazing. Right. And I'm such an optimist naturally that I wanted to write checks into everything. I, I you know, most everything that was coming across my plate, but I wonder if like, as, as VCs, do we get more jaded over time? <laughs> you know, because you start seeing the same idea three or four different ways with different teams. And you're kind of like, I've seen this story before. It's not going to work. And is there like this like inverted you where you kind of you really or maybe your your optimism just sort of declines over time? Uh, I am. I think one of the reasons that generational transfer in VC funds is healthy is that you actually want to get like new generations coming in that know what their peers yeah. are doing, or perhaps a couple of folks that are a bit younger, et cetera, are doing uh, because I. I, I think you're right. Like a lot of folks will have seen some iteration of X business model in, you know, the last innovation wave and might be jaded by that or might have lost money yeah. on it or whatever. And then will be predisposed not to do it that might miss it. And so um I, I do think I do think like for better and for worse, I think you like end up doing more things like the things that gave you success. And that's one of the reasons we have bias and venture right. and perhaps one of the reasons that like yeah. you know, fintech investors, state fintech, whatever. Um and and so I I think reinvention is important because I think that's how that's how we'll get to innovation. I love that. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation and learned a ton, and I'm sure the audience will as well. Thank you so much for having me. We'll talk soon.